Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, wow. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, I feel like that applause is going to be for our next guest, our first guest. Um, but uh, thank you. I'm glad, I'm glad to be opening the industry conference at 2014 at Toronto International Film Festival. And welcome to the masterclass. My name is Renee Robinson. I am the industry programmer here at TIFF. And over the next seven days, we have a very, very exciting lineup on stage, presentations, panels, conversations. Over 200 guests from around the world will share their expertise on topics such as financing, distribution, marketing, co-production, and the future of cinema. We really have an amazing lineup for this week for you. Please be sure to check your industry guides. They're in your delegate bags and, of course, also on the website to make sure that you're keeping track of um, everything that we're doing this year, this week. A big thank you, I have to say, to the entire industry programming and events team who are making all of this happen. We'd also like to thank the CBC and the staff here at the Glen Gould Studio for having us back this year. We are thrilled to be taking over the Glen Gould Studio and also the adjacent Vimeo Industry Convergence Center, which some of you may have been at for the uh, Festival 101 session. Today's masterclass is a part of our Creative Process Day at the conference, and we also would like to thank Pinewood Studios Group and their Directors Guild of Canada for co-presenting this session with us. When we started programming for this year's conference, we knew that we wanted to kick off the event with a distinguished guest speaker, someone who knows about the creative process of filmmaking inside out, but also the business aspect of the film industry, someone who has been involved in every aspect of the creation of a film, from idea to development to production to release. Barry Levinson's latest film, The Humbling, had its North American premiere here at the festival last night. His other directing credits include well-known titles such as Diner, Good Morning Vietnam, Rain Man, Bugsy, Toys, Wag the Dog, Sleepers, Liberty Heights, there's so many, the list goes on and on and on. He's a producer, director, screenwriter, author, editor, and actor. He won the Academy Award as Best Director for Rain Man, and has been nominated for numerous other Academy Awards and Golden Globes. And in addition, he was a producer on the groundbreaking TV series Homicide, and has won several Emmys over the course of his writing and directing career in television. Barry is a true master and visionary of the art of filmmaking, and we are extremely honored to have him here with us this morning. Our moderator for today's session is Pete Hammond, the awards columnist at Deadline.com. So we really have an amazing morning session for you. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Pete Hammond and Barry Levinson. Well, thank you uh, for coming out here to, uh, this is the first master class of this uh, edition of the Toronto Film Festival, so very excited that you're doing it. Sure. And uh, I know you've flown from Venice, where the film had its world premiere, yeah. and then last night here in front of 1,500 people, The Humbling, your latest movie, uh, was a, a smash success. Uh, it was an, ex it, first of all, to have 1,500 people on a giant screen in an amazing, amazing uh, theater. And, and to be able to hear the audience and the response and the laughs, and it was, it was one of those overwhelming nights of, uh, of a response that uh, will stay with you for a long time. We're gonna get to the humbling and talk more in detail um, uh, later on, but it's so great to see movies as they are meant to be seen yeah. here at this festival in a theater with full audiences rather than watching it on our keychain or however we're doing it these days. I know. Yeah. I mean, it, <laughs> So somehow people think you can watch and then hit pause and then come back and then hit pause, <laughs> you know, as opposed to just a, just one event, just to watch the, the totality of it all. But such are the changes, uh, I guess, in life. 
I guess the business is changing in, in a big way. But let me take you back to, to your beginnings, because it's interesting. You never really uh, aspired uh, to this kind of career initially. Is that right, when you were growing up in? Uh, well, I mean, I wouldn't know where to begin. I mean, you know, the, if you could be a kid and say, you know, I'd like to write and direct in Baltimore. I mean, I didn't even know who you would talk to about it. Uh, <laughs> and so I, I had no. I, the simple thing that happened, and this is interesting and you know, the shorthand of it all, is that I, I, I went to American University and there was a, a teacher there who took a liking to me and he was the program director of the television station and they had a training program and I got involved in the training program and one of the things we did was to roll commercial breaks into the late show and the late, late show. Uh. And that was what I did and I started seeing all these movies, 10 movies a week. And suddenly I'd see a movie and I'd tell friends of mine at the diner, I said, do you ever hear this movie Citizen Kane? It's really an interesting <laughs> film. And they go, what is it called, Citizen Kane? Well, I never heard that. And so I started seeing all these movies and John Ford movies and then I became aware of directors. And, and then the, I, so I had my own little program for a year of seeing 10 movies a week. Wow. And that was the, be the beginning of starting to pay attention to, to this uh, whole craft. So how did you decide to, to move to Los Angeles, or how did that come about uh, um, in all of this? You, you worked at the local station? I worked at the local station, and I used to work on the Ranger House show with the hand puppets and you know things like that, and the news programs, and I became an assistant director. And then I, I ultimately quit and went to Los Angeles and really didn't know what to do with my life. I had no idea. And, uh, uh, can I just, I'll tell you a real condensed version. I, I was down in Manhattan Beach in the, in the late 60s and I was hanging around, I got friends with a guy named George and, uh, and his, his friend Tuna, we would hang out together. And one day he said, I need a car uh, to go up into Hollywood because my car's broken and uh, can you give me a ride? And I said, okay, and we drive up there and we pull up to where he had to go and he said, well, come on in. I said, well, what are you gonna do? He said, I wanna check out an acting class. I said, an acting class? I, he said, well, come in. I said, well, I don't want to do that. I mean, acting. I don't want to even be around that, near it. I don't like that. <laughs> and anyway, he drags me in, and then he, afterwards he, he signs up to, be, you know, to study this. And he said, why don't you join? I said, well, what am I going to do? You know, George, what am I going to do? I don't want to be good-looking girls. Good-looking girls there, you know, it'd be something. <laughs> and so I'm thinking about what do I want to do, and it's an hour back and forth. And he said... Um, come on, we'll split the ride during the week. And I go up, I talk to the acting teacher the next day, and he said, I said, I'd like to join, but I don't want to do anything. <laughs> he said, well, what do you want to do? I said, just want to watch, I'll watch. He said, no, you have to participate, you got to do the exercises, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, I sign up, I start going, George gets bored, George doesn't want to go anymore, now I'm going to acting school alone. And <laughs> <laughs> and eventually, I moved up into Hollywood, and I left George. And, I, and with, you know, this is pre-cell phone, so within three months, I lose contact with, and I never see George again. Oh my gosh! And people say, "Well, then," I said, and you know, so he is responsible in a sense for really getting me into the business because of the acting school led to improvs, and improvs led to, you know, performing, you know, in nightclubs, and nightclubs led to writing screenplays, and then ultimately getting direct. So George, in a sense, was responsible. And I never saw him again. Then I go with my wife in like 2000, we go to the movies to see this film, Blow. Sure. And it says oh, Man yeah. Manhattan Beach. I, said, oh, I was in Manhattan Beach, <laughs> 1967. I was there. And then it says, hey, George. And I go, George. And Johnny Depp is playing the role of George, George Young, who is, becomes the largest right. cocaine dealer in North America. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the George that got me involved in the business. <laughs> That's funny. I was going to say, I actually live in Manhattan Beach, so I was going to look him up for you, but <laughs> I didn't know where this story but that, was. It's a true story. Isn't that bizarre, <laughs> how, how crazy life is? So. But in a way, you make it sound so, so you worked on, uh, you know, obviously uh, the Carol Burnett show and the Tim Conway show and uh, yeah. all those great shows where I imagine you would get incredible training as, as a writer early on. It was very good. I mean, you had to write really fast and, and, uh, and you had to, you know, every, every week you got to turn out, you know, something. And so it was a, it was a great training program and, and for me in that regard. I, I didn't really want to do sketches, but I was able to do it. And th that led to, well, I'd like to write something longer. And then ultimately I tried to write, you know, uh, 
episodic television, and I never could get a job, and then I thought, maybe I'll just write an original screenplay, so. and which led to uh, Injustice for All that I co-wrote, and then I ultimately did Diner, which I got a chance to direct. So yeah, with Valerie Curtin, uh, yeah. you were nominated for an Academy Award. When you say, maybe I'll write an original screenplay, that's pretty good. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> those, yeah those early films. Lucky, uh, yeah, that happened that way. Yeah. With Al Pacino, oddly enough, you know, your, your career has come full circle in a way because that was one of your early screenplays. And now it was. And we spent time together, oddly enough, because Norman Jewison, uh, who I ran, in the other, ran into the other night, uh, was so kind enough to have us there during the whole rehearsal period. And so I was around Al and started to see how he was beginning to put the character together, and, and so that was, a, that was a really influential period. I think of uh, Al Pacino and the, and the famous lines in his career, you know, Attica, Attica, and, uh, you know, they're trying to pull me back in from the Godfather, but the line there, you're out of order, you know. You're out of order, yes. Was that something in the script? Or yes, no, that was the big scene, you know, you're out of order, you know, that, <laughs> you know the whole, whatever the lines were, I can't remember anymore, but <laughs> it was, uh, you know, that was... A, that was a big piece in it, yeah. Another big influence for you uh, was Mel Brooks, yeah. obviously. How did, how did you get into the world of Mel Brooks and suddenly find yourself uh, doing two Mel Brooks movies there, silent movies? It was actually, real. I mean, it's, when I think back to it, it's really strange or crazy. Uh, Ron Clark was a producer on the Tim Conway show, which ran for 13 episodes. And, uh, Actually, Tim thought that the show was never going to last, so the very first episode that we did was his Christmas show because he thought he would never get to Christmas and have the show. It would be canceled before the Christmas show. So we, <laughs> we, he started, the first one was the Christmas show. And so that got canceled, and uh, about a year or so, or, or we're doing Carol Burnett, and Ron Clark said, I have an idea for a movie that I think would be great for Mel Brooks, and I'm going to talk to him about it. And if he likes it, it'd be great for you and Rudy DeLuca, who's my partner, to come write it. And I hang up and I say, well, what's the odds that's going to happen? Yeah. I mean, that he's just going to call Mel Brooks and he's going to meet and we're going to be writers. And literally, an hour and a half later, he said, I told Mel the idea. He loves it. He'd like to meet you guys tomorrow. And we went over and we met. We kind of hit it off. And we started to work on silent movie. Wow, that, you make it that sound bizarre. That <laughs> I mean, and so we started to do that. It was about a year of uh, w you know working on that, and then we, I, he was great that he would have us there while it was being shot. We were there during the editing process, during the scoring, and in a sense, it was sort of like uh, film school for me. So that leading into high anxiety, two movies I saw every aspect of the of the process. And then I began to think about, well, what would happen if he did this and if he did this? And what happens if you put the camera here instead of here? And I saw then my mind was beginning to think of how else and how, what other things can be done. And that, those acting lessons with George really paid off on high anxiety because you had a very memorable scene in front of the camera in that. Uh, uh, yeah, the bellhop uh, with the paper going, here's your paper, here's your paper. <laughs> we did the psycho scene. Um, if you haven't seen it, where I played the bellhop, the demented bellhop with a, trying to stab him with a newspaper. Yeah, doing the Bernard Harriman kind yeah. of. Uh... But that came about literally, uh, um, from those who may have not seen it, because we tried to deal all, all the Hitchcock things. And I was making fun of Bernard Herrmann's music in the shower scene with that, ha, 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 that real high sound. And I was suddenly putting it to dialogue like, here, here, here. And I was imitating. <laughs> and Mel said, that's so insane, you've got to do that. <laughs> and then I ultimately did that little character, uh, little piece in the, in, the, in the movie. Wow, and then, you know, obviously at a certain point you, you segue to directing and uh, what, a, what a debut, Diner, your first uh, big directing. Uh... First time to write and direct yeah. and, try to do, and try to get it to sound. I mean, for me, the, the, the thing was, um, I wanted, to, I wanted a movie that felt exactly the way I remembered the, the end of the 50s and, and, the, and the way we talked to one another. So it didn't have a, a real jokey thing to it, but it could be humorous. And so I wanted it to sort of flow and be messy and, and, and try to capture that. And, uh, and, and that was just really it. I wanted it to just to not, not look flashy, just look like that was the time frame, you know? 
And of course, I always remember, you know, the first review, you know, because it's like, oh, variety. You know, what does variety say? And, it, and uh, I'll never forget it. it said, Diner is a dark and depressing drama. Ah. That, that was the first line I read. It was like, huh? <laughs> you know, you, and it, there's no humor at all in it. So it, we went through this phase where Diner was really, it, it, in a sense, you got a, uh, I got a chance to, to deal with the whole business, all the ups and downs in one movie, because it was so uh, disliked by the studio and the initial press, and it was taken out of release, never to be seen again. So it was literally like, well, that's the end of my career. I made one movie, that's the end of your career. It's over. And then it suddenly turned around. Pauline Kael saw it and liked it, and all of a sudden it came into New York, and all of a sudden it was like sold out, <laughs> and it, there's this buzz, and all of a sudden you went from like, you'll never work again, to all of a sudden like, you know, you got attention. Yeah. And at least you're going to get to make one more movie. Pauline Kael was very good about championing, you know, and finding movies and, and championing movies like that. I mean, it takes somebody like that to... to well, I mean, out. that's the nature of the business is that, you know, you, you, it, you're constantly, you know, uh, you could be celebrated and attacked and celebrated and attacked, you know. Yeah. And Mel Brooks used to use a, a great example, and he said, even with an audience, you'd sit there and you're showing your movie for the first time with a big audience, and you have like a a barometer and you're going, good, good, I'm out of the business. Good, good, I'm out of the business. <laughs> it just, you know, in retrospect, that movie was 1982. Yeah. 1982, when you say the studio hated it, what did they think they were getting? I mean, you know, I mean, it, it, it was a terrific film and to think that they, were they expecting some other kind of movie or something? I, I think they were. I think they were, they were looking for the kind of like, you know, the, the, the goofy, you know, people. And they somehow thought that it was supposed to be high school people. Ah. And the, I heard a comment, well, you know, that, that, that Mickey Rourke doesn't seem like a high school student. <laughs> And I don't know why they thought it was going to be a high school, but I, I think somehow they thought it was going to be a romp. Uh, and so we didn't fit that. And, and there hadn't been that kind of a yeah. comedy, you know, slash drama, perhaps. Well, it's also dialogue-driven and just stories. You know, yeah. the roast beef's a perfect example in that. And, and well, I mean, the roast beef is actually an interesting thing because I had a conversation with uh, uh, one of the studio people who said, well, you know, you got a lot to learn about editing. And I said, well, I'm sure I do. And I said, well, like an example. He said, well, you know, they said something about, are you going to eat that sandwich? And you're not going to eat the sandwich. And he said, he said, just cut right through all that. Go right to the story. <laughs> and I said, well, that is the story. <laughs> That's really it. It just talks, that is the way to talk about relationship. Rather than talking about how long have we known one another and how long have we been friends and whatever, it, we don't talk that way to one another. We, it, it comes out in this sideways thing. So the fact that they're talking about roast beef and if you're going to eat it and you're not going to eat it tells you how well we know and how, how well they know one another. Right. Yeah. And that, that, that was the point of it. And uh, it was uh, an uphill battle. Awesome. Well, editing yeah. now. That, well, you worked in a local station where they, where they did local movies things and they, those always got cut and things. And I can't imagine the people doing that. Like I remember once in LA they ran Singing in the Rain but they cut out all the songs. Yeah. So it was just basically in the rain. Well, it, <laughs> <laughs> well the one that we, I remember is uh, the, because it was always like cut for, you know, advance the story, advance the story. And uh, I didn't do it, but one of the other, uh, you know, guys working on it, it was the movie San Francisco. And so I think the Jenna McDonald's in San Francisco, and the chandelier starts to shake and everything else, and there's this rumble, and then they go to commercial break, and then they come back and the whole city has been destroyed. <laughs> and they just eliminated the entire earthquake. It was like 25 minutes he just took out of the movie. Well, thank God you, you, you survived the uh, studio there on that one. But that was the beginning of, of your Baltimore uh, phase. That, uh, so famously, people talk about, in your career, you have gone back and back and back to Baltimore and, and made it immortal on screen in, in different films, from Tin Men to Avalon, the wonderful uh, Avalon, you. Uh, yes, you should applaud Avalon because that was. Thank you. I, I, I call that's your Amacord. That's your that's a that's a beautiful film. And then Liberty Heights, which I think was unfairly uh, sort of like distributed or whatever, not as widely seen. Well, what happens is uh, the studio uh, heads changed, so it was made under uh, 
Terry Semmel and, and Bob Daly, and they were the ones that championed it, and then they left before the movie came out, and then a new head comes in, and then that's not their priority, and then it, it, it gets lost. And those things happen periodically. Sometimes you'll see some movie on, 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 you know, on cable or whatever, and you go, gee, that was a really good movie. What happened to that? And a lot of it gets lost in this whole distribution world where some really interesting work is never really seen, unfortunately. And, and that's part of, I think, uh, the struggle with so many filmmakers today, that there's some really interesting work, but they can't find that outlet that really you know, brings it uh, to the attention of, uh, of an audience. Getting that distribution, well, you know, the, the major studios, you made that at Warner Brothers, but the major studios don't seem to be by and large, interested in that kind of movie anymore? No, well, they're not that interested in movies about people, you know. Um, <laughs> it, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, um, you, you, you know, because they, they what happens is it is such a corporate sensibility now that they're looking for you know, the, that ten pole, the, the, the ten pole, that's what we have to do. And you go, look, in the end of the day, you know, we like stories and we like characters, and that's why television, and I, and I say television, that's including all the cable and the streaming and, and Netflix and everything else, that's why that is becoming so big, because that's where the stories are. That's where the characters are, and that's where the actors want to go, because they get a chance to play some really interesting things, as opposed to these more mechanical type. And not that you can't have it, but we're sort of, we're out of balance. We're so top heavy to these kind of action, action. And I think that's why you're seeing this shift taking place today that we consider the more uh, fascinating work is happening you know, from Netflix and HBO and, and all the cable outlets. I, I know, Netflix, this whole streaming thing has really, really taken off now. Jane Fonda's doing a series for them with Lily Tomlin and Martin Sheen, and they're really getting top, top people. <laughs> well, I think in the, in the end, I, we're, we're, there's gonna, I, I think we're looking at uh, the, a radical change that's about to take place, that I think that the idea of, of theatrical and streaming and cable and everything else is all gonna merge into it, and it'll just be, you know, there's film, if you wanna call it that, or whatever, digital, and we'll watch it in different ways, and I think we're gonna look at a, I think we're in the beginning of a massive transformation that's going to take place, um, which I think can be very beneficial because we'll, we'll, we'll get, I think we'll get back to more of a diversity that what film used to do in the past where you had all kinds of uh, you know, types of films being done. And we can see uh, a movie like Liberty Heights a, a little more easily maybe uh, in that kind of future. But right now I want to take a look at a clip from that one, from your Baltimore films, and, uh, and let's take a look at that and then we can talk a little bit about it. So this is uh, Liberty Heights. Liberty Heights. Um, you have returned and returned and returned to Baltimore. And, and are these autobiographical? Is this, this your uh, quartet of films uh, autobiographical? Or I, is mean, it? <laughs> I mean, in some ways, I, what I wanted to cover, and you probably not have seen the movie, I mean, uh, you know, Liberty Heights deals with, you know, race and class distinction. And I, I wanted to examine it because in 1954 in Baltimore was the beginning of the integration of schools. And so um, I, I thought it'd be, it, it would be interesting to try to look into the, you know, the, in a sense, people coming together for the first time had never, ever, you know, been together. So blacks and whites had never really been together and to talk about things you know, as, as simple as that might be. And, and I was fascinated by it, and, and I thought I wanted to kind of explore the beginning of, of integration, not in, in terms of young people. And, uh, and so it was based on a lot of things that went on when I was growing up in Baltimore. Do you have and, another? And the distinction that there was, you know, anti-Semitism and all of that, and we didn't quite, we didn't quite grasp it or understand it you know, that well. And, uh, you know, because it was, you know, you couldn't go to certain places, you know, or to, to swim, you know, that, you know, the, you know, Jews weren't allowed or whatever. And, 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 I, and, and I didn't want to do it in just this heavy dramatic fashion. It is this kind of comedy drama. 
Do you have another Baltimore? Do you want to go back? Doug? I'd yeah. like to do one last final one, which is, sort of brings the, the end of the diner and uh, the, end of the, the end of the 60s. Wow. Yeah. That would be something. I'd like to do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so many different, you're almost like Howard Hawks to me. You've done so many different types of movies. You know, you've done like that we just saw, but you've obviously Rain Man, for which you won an Academy Award, was the best picture. The Natural, one of the great, great sports movies, baseball movies ever right. made. Um, on and on and on. What, what makes you spark to uh, an idea? What, what makes you get behind Well, I don't know. See, I'm, I've never been taken with the idea of, um, in other words, some, some you know, directors, writers like to work in a genre. And, and a genre in itself doesn't interest me. I, I'm just sort of interested in stories and characters and wherever that may be. And so I, I don't have anything like, well, I want to do this or I want to do that. Something starts to present itself, and then you go down that road. It's like, you know, the humbling. I mean, Al called me and he read the book, and he said, you know, I think there's a really interesting character, and what do you think? And I, I would never, never have thought about the idea of a, of a, a man, an actor, in sort of crises in, in an, in, as we ultimately, you know, did it. But when I read it, I thought, well, this could be really interesting. This is a fascinating character. And so, you know, that's how it happened. But so I'm, I'm not looking specifically for anything other than something that just stirs my imagination. And speaking of Al and Robert Redford in The Natural and uh, Dustin Hoffman, you've worked with, and of course, Warren Beatty in Bugsy. Uh, you've worked with so many big stars, and, and sometimes we've heard stories about stars being somewhat difficult to work for. But you came from an acting background, writing background. Can you talk yeah, about well, I mean, I, you know, it's, uh, I, it, look, I think there's nothing better than if you had some kind of theater background. So I think the two years that I studied and I was there every day for two years is helpful because, you know, sometimes you get into a, a scene and an actor's having a problem trying to figure out, well, how do I, what this and whatever it may be. And if you can find um, something that can help, then it, it, you might take it to the next step. I mean, let me give you an example. Uh, we were doing, uh, I'll use Rain Man. Uh, we're doing a Rain Man, and, and uh, there was a scene with Dustin, very at the beginning, the first couple of days. And I said to Dustin, I said, Well, the character seems too depressed. He seems too depressed. And I said, Everything we've known and read about is that an autistic is, is busier and, and not just depressed. And so, you know, they're looking around, they're, they, they're involved, it's how many lights are on the ceiling, they're, doing, they're, they're busy, busy. And he went, oh, that's good, that's good. So now we go to do, you know, a take, and now he's looking, he's, he's counting the lights or whatever, and Tom's talking to him, and he doesn't respond, and he doesn't respond, I go, cut. I said, Dustin, you, you know, he's, he's talking to him, you have to respond. He said, I got so involved in the lights <laughs> that I, I, didn't, I didn't hear what he said. <laughs> I, I said, well, we can't, you can't, we can't work that way. That's not gonna, that's not gonna work. He said, what are we gonna do? I said, well, why don't you just sort of like, you know he's there, but you don't want to deal with him. Which led to, if you watch the movie, he says, yeah. He's always saying, yeah. If he's looking, uh, you know, uh, Ray, you want to do that? Yeah, yeah. You want to do this? Yeah, yeah. And, and then if he finally sees what it is, he might not do it. But the yeah it sort of tethers him to what's going on, so that way he can be busy and at the same time pay attention to what's happening. And the yeah, if you watch it, you see it's a very important little teeny you know, tool to use. So it was very helpful. So you, you try to find a way around it. So he came one day, and, and, and Dustin is such a character, and he said, I don't know how to do this scene. It says when I get nervous, I'm supposed to go into a pitching motion. It takes too long. And I said, well, let me see. And I said, you're right. I said, we have to find something else. So I, I came to him and I said, when you get agitated, why don't you do who's on first? He said, well, what do you mean who's on first? You mean the Abbott and Costello? I said, yeah. He said, well, who plays the other guy? I said, you, just, you do both. And you don't know. It's funny because, you know, autistic, it's just a rhythm. You know, who's the first baseman? That's what I'm saying, the first baseman. Yeah, the, yeah, who, who, who's the first baseman? And just do it like a mantra. And, and that ultimately got into the movie and then, Periodically, he said, why don't we just do it here where he's nervous? And so you, you sense his anxiety and how it comes out. So that was a way to fix a problem he was having. 
and to, and, to, and to keep moving along as opposed to you're gonna shut down trying to figure out what you're gonna do. And that, and that became a character uh, a moment that ultimately resonates throughout the film. So sometimes you have to figure out how do you solve a problem and maybe you can add another moment to it because he was right. He could, he could the pitching motion would take too long and didn't really tell us enough. And so uh, that device became a, a, a character trait. And something very memorable yep. uh, in the film. And, and wasn't that film, actually you, had, you made it when, when the writer's strike was going yeah. on? Yeah. yeah. So we, had a, we made up things as we were going along um, during that period of time. And, but we were shooting in continuity because we were literally going from Cincinnati to, to LA. So a lot of things happened along the road. Now, uh, another actor you worked with many times. Uh, I actually, have, let me show the clip, and you'll know what, who I'm talking about, and then we're going to talk about not only him, but also uh, this, this kind of film, this kind of subject that you're into here. So uh, take a look at the clip right now from Good Morning America. Oh, good morning, I mean, America. sorry, good morning, Vietnam. All right, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, good morning, Vietnam. You know what morning show I was watching this morning. Um, anyway, uh, obviously, Robin Williams, very sad. Uh, but to watch him here, that, I, I can't imagine taking that talent and putting him on the screen and, and, and containing that talent. But you did it brilliantly. You got an Oscar nomination for Best Actor for that yeah. particular performance. Well, you know, it's, I mean, that, that scene um, actually um, evolved um, because he was, he's a radio guy, and um, there was a point where he's not gonna do the radio, and I said to Robin one day, I said, you know, if you're on the radio, you don't know who, if people laugh, because you, you, there, is no, there is no audience right there. And, and I said, I don't know, it seems like we need a scene, one scene that he's out there, and he gets a sense that they actually care, that he is helpful, that he's on the radio, and he, and he, and he plays around, and, he, you know, he's good for morale, and that he can really see the cause and effect. So that scene, we, we just literally threw into the movie, and, uh, and then we don't have the other part of it where the trucks are leaving, trucks after trucks after trucks. We actually only had six trucks. We just kept going around the camera, and <laughs> started to look like there was a whole convoy of all these trucks. But I thought it was important, and so we would play with that, and in th this is one of the, you know, the more kind of, you know, free kind of improv scenes, but to build it off of that. He, he was great uh, because he had such an interest in people. And w what I, I was always fascinated by is that how great he was in, with the Vietnamese in the movie because he really took the time to talk to them, to, to understand them. So when he, when he would play with them, he, he had established somewhat of a relationship. And, and Robin as an individual was was a very caring uh, person and a, and, a, and a great curiosity. And I, and I think that really informed the movie in a, in a lot of different ways. You worked with him several times. Yep. Uh, you worked with him on Toys, which, was that a frustrating, uh, the way it ultimately, uh, I, I don't think it was a success uh, at the box office. No, um, and, and, and again, it was a film uh, that was probably misunderstood, and it was also a change in studio management. So the people who made it left, and then there wasn't um, someone in charge. And because, it, to me, it was a black comedy, but it's, it's all in primary colors. So it all looks kind of like sweeter than it really is. And I, I think it, because there was no real publicity to set it up, and there weren't these discussions that you understand that the, that the darkness was underneath it. And so normally in a traditional like black comedy, you went, oh yeah, that's a you know Doctor Strange love or something like that. This one was all primary colors, and uh, and I think a lot of the things that the movie was dealing with the idea of what we now have, uh, you know, with all of the kind of remote control you know cameras and all of that stuff to fly things and blow stuff up, and the, I mean it was and, way ahead of its yeah, time. Yeah, and the Google glasses and all of that kind of stuff uh, that takes place, and the, and the video. The, the, you know, the video games that are actually, that you can fight wars off of video screens, et cetera, and, and drones and whatever, all part of the movie, but I don't think, you know, because of, you know, not being set up, or maybe it's too strange for its time, I don't know, but it was, it was a, 
you know, you're out there trying to push the boundaries of, of it things. It really was, and sometimes when you push the boundaries, people aren't ready, but then it no. lives on. I, I, and, and we've chosen a clip from Toys in particular today, also another one with Robin Williams, to take a look at it, and I think it's a movie that'll be reassessed uh, as years go on. I don't know, we'll see. Let's take a look at uh, Toys. What is this clip? They <laughs> kill your little scene. <laughs> I gotta see that movie again. I haven't seen it in a while, but wow, looking at the production design too is extraordinary. And yeah, Nando Scarfiotti did the production design, and it's really, it's really very interesting. I mean, it's, it's the movie. I mean, they live in a pop-out house, um, in, and the visuals of it are really kind of, and you know, there, there wasn't a lot of you know CGI back then, so a lot of this had to be done in certain ways, and it's a. It, it visually, it's rather fascinating. It's sort of somewhere like you know to the to the left of Magritte in terms of like the visuals of it, but it's uh, it, it, it certainly in its time was uh, was not admired, if we use that word. <laughs> well, you know, I think that's true of a lot of movies that go on to be classics that they're not quite uh, recognized then. Uh, Rain Man actually was not a hit right out of the gate either. No, it didn't. Uh, it only did six million on its uh, first weekend. So by today, you know, uh, the world, it would probably have been gone in its second week. But it, it started at six and it ended up, you know, doing a, a, a half a billion worldwide back in the times when it only cost $22 million to make. But it's, you know, it, it just caught on and then it, it, it word of mouth spread when there was real word of mouth. You know, it's different now. Because uh, you open 35 or 4,000 theaters, and then you know a couple weeks, and it's gone. So that one just kept, you know, opening at six, and the next week it did seven, and the next week it did eight, and then it was doing nine and ten, and then all of a sudden it was doing 14 million dollars, and it just kept growing and growing. But uh, I, I don't think that really happens anymore. No, it's a it's definitely yeah. a different business. I, I want to look uh, at another clip here, sort of also in line. Wag the dog, which is a, a movie you made. Uh, very quickly, I guess. Uh, yep. uh, really great satire, also dealing with war and all kinds of issues like that. Uh, can you talk a little bit about Wag the Dog before I run this clip? Well, I mean, I, I, you know, we're talking about you know Hollywood and politics and how they intertwine, and uh, it's obviously accelerated since then. But how you can begin to spin a story that ultimately, you know, gains weight, and how you can use, you know. Uh, certain tactics to get the press to go one way and another, and how you can basically invent um, things that look like they're real. So the idea of using green screen and you know, uh, creating an event that never happened and letting the press cha chase after it. And so using Hollywood techniques mixed in with the political circus of it all and the media and the dangers of it all was the, the kind of the, the idea behind it. And it evolved into you know, David Mamet working on it and becoming Wag the Dog. Really great, great movie. Let's take a look at a clip from Wag the Dog. <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> Again, that's a movie that sort of hit, you know, when, you, when it was released and things were going on, and now it looks like you look at this and you, you say, wow, this was also way ahead of its time. Yeah, no, uh, and... Uh, we, we came out, and then, of course, the whole Monica Lewinsky thing happened uh, three weeks after it came out. And, and some people thought that we actually did a thing where we put on the, you know, the cap, you know, because, you know, she's a Girl Scout and this thing, whatever, a uh, Firefly Girl or something like that. So it looked like we, we actually did some work to try to make it more of that. But it, it was just the way it was. I mean, so the fact that he was having this you know, relationship and the scandal and whatever it may be. I mean, so we touched on certain things that were going on in, at the time, but more importantly, it, the, the dangers of what you can, in fact, start to do and how you can, all you need to do is get it out for a very short period of time, and then it starts to go down that road. And then you can begin to play with news and, and the reality and the fantasy of it until you're not sure what's what. And so there is a real danger to it, and of course, you know, we did it back then, but it seemed like a valid idea, and now, of course, it's become reality. Reality. <laughs> um, you're here at Toronto for the humbling, your latest film, which you told me backstage astounding. Tell them how much this was made for, this film. 
We did it for um, just about $2 million, and we shot it in 20 days. And uh, what made it interesting, because if you talk about like, a, you know, independent, you know, this is like about as independent as it can get, because we could have made it for more, but we didn't want to have all the kind of uh, pre-sale obligations so that we, we got it to a price that we can just do what we wanted to do and how we wanted to do it. And, Ultimately, no one's going to get hurt economically because they're going to make you know, money off of it. But what we do is we would shoot for, say, five days, and then we would shoot, uh, shut down for maybe a month, and then we came back, and then we did it. So we did it in bits and pieces throughout the fall into the beginning of winter. And uh, you know, to save money, I even shot some of it in my house in, you know, in, in Connecticut. And so uh, it, it, was, it was a way to put the, a movie together and to be able to play with it the way we thought it should be. And, and Al uh, it has such a passion to act and to try and to experiment. He's like such a great person to collaborate with because he's, he's, so, he's fearless. You can talk, we would sit and talk about an idea and then we would shoot it and see where it went and then we would modify it and change it and we would add to it. And he has this energy and this passion to like, to really act. And when I think about it, I don't know who else can play the role because I mean he is a movie star, but he constantly goes back to to theater all the time. He's constantly doing it, so he brought a lot to the table. And uh, even though it's not his life, but he's got a lot of experiences that we're able to kind of, you know, bring to the, to to this piece of material. It's great. You obviously have a really good working relationship with him. You did. Uh, you don't know Jack, also the Jack Trevorkian uh, television movie yep. with him too. But I thought he was great. He, you know, he's great at comedy. A lot of people like forget how good Al Pacino is. But there's big laughs, big laughs in this movie. In the humbling, and no, it's uh, at times you can't hear some of the dialogue when you have a you know a big audience like that. I mean, it was really. I think it surprised a lot of people because. On, on one level, it is a tragic comedy, and it's a man in, in crisis, an actor in crisis at a point in his life, but there's an enormous amount of humor that goes through it, so it's not some a somber piece of work. But, it, but there's an honesty to the, the pain of it all, and, I, and, I, and last night's response was just, I think, so overwhelming for us because suddenly, first of all, to be here in, in Toronto and to see it on this huge screen in this 1,500-seat you know, movie palace. It was really a, a great, great moment. I, I, we had such fun last night. Right. Well, before we wrap up today, and I can't do Barry Levinson's career in an hour. There's, you could just go on and on and on. <laughs> There's so much interesting stuff to talk about. But let's take a look at a movie uh, that will be coming out as soon as uh, distribution deals are made and are, are around yep. the world. So here is the humbling. <laughs> Man, uh, they just let it go and you let them go with that I mean that really that was uh, I, I said last night I mean, and this is only a, a little thing happening way towards the end of the movie so you're, I think you know you have to understand it in its context but this was the first day that uh, Greta Gerwig worked so that, that scene uh, is her first day, and then there's a lot of elements that got you know, added to it when you, when you see the movie. Uh, but uh, it was, it was a, a terrific experience because you, you, you're, we were able to kind of really play with the material and, and see what else you can bring to it. And, and uh, Greta was terrific because you, there she is with Al Pacino, and, and there are certain scenes where they just go toe to toe and she's so strong with him you know comedically dramatically uh, it, it, it was it was a, a real uh, for me it was a fascinating period of time and it was exciting and very rewarding in that regard and you got to shoot in your own house well, yeah. yes you get up in the morning and come downstairs and shoot a scene <laughs> Welcome to the new world of filmmaking. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much, Barry Levinson. Thank you very much. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barry. Um, sit down. Sit <laughs> down. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Too. Thanks a lot. Yeah. All right. We'll just ask somebody. Um, I'd just like to ask our partners and co-presenters of this session to uh, say the, uh, the goodbye words for this session. Um, 
We have Andy Weltman here, the exec executive vice president of, president of Pinewood Studios International, and Tim Southam, the president of the Directors Guild of Canada. Come on up, guys. I'll make this really quick because no one wants to hear me speak. Um, I just want to tell you how proud Pinewood is to be a part of this, to Mr. Levinson for inspiring us. I just got to tell you from a personal standpoint, you had me at Manhattan Beach because I'm from Manhattan Beach <laughs> and I actually live next door to the house where a blow was shot. So, yeah. so you had me right there. <laughs> but this has been such an inspiring thing. Pinewood has been uh, working with TIFF on the Masterclass series for about, I think, three years now. It just keeps getting better and better and it's so inspiring to hear you speak to Pete Hammond for guiding us through his career, um, to, to uh, Tim Southam from DGC to working with, working with us. We hope we can do this many more times again. And to TIFF for organizing this. Pinewood um, is known for our movie studios. We have studios all over the world, starting in London, and of course our premier facility here in Toronto. But what we try to do is find ways to inspire the next generation, and we do that through film funds, through production services, but I don't think there's any better way to do that than through the Masterclass series and sitting here and listening to a, a legend like Barry Levinson speak. So we thank you so much for letting us be a part of it and for being here. Thank and you. Tim Salvin. Thank you. Well, Barry, you, you said it. You know that directors all over the world are facing, are, are in, a, in a fantastic revolution. We're, we're facing unbelievable change. You articulated it so well. I don't think there's anybody in the Directors Guild of Canada, or I dare say any filmmaker who doesn't know that you are the pioneer the person who uh, made all screens necessary and made it necessary for us to do excellent work on all screens. So thank you very, thank very you. much from all directors, all filmmakers, thank as you. we approach this new world of many different screens. Uh, I, I want to thank Pinewood very quickly, uh, great partner year round, uh, putting their, your, your resources at the service of the creative community in Toronto over and over again. Come to the DGC Awards, major partner, Pinewood. Uh, also to the Toronto Film Festival for, of course, for decades, for putting the director at the center of the conversation. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Barry Levinson. And thank you, Pete. Great interview.